Hi, I am Ning Yan. I'm a professor in the School of Medicine, Tsinghua University. I'm also an investigator of Center for Structural Biology at Tsinghua University, Beijing, China. Welcome to my iBiology seminar series. In the first part, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to membrane transport proteins. We all know that on Earth, all life forms share one common feature. That is, we are made of cells. Cell is the most fundamental unit of life. And despite different sizes, shapes, functions, all kinds of cells also share one common feature. That is, they are enclosed by biomembranes, mostly of lipid bilayers. Not only cells, in higher organisms within the cells, we are also compartmentalized by membranes. Therefore, we have these organelles, mitochondria, chloroplast, and the plasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, etc. The presence of the membrane defines the boundary of a cell or an organelle. It protects the contents from the environment, and it allows the simultaneous occurring of different chemical reactions. So they help life. They keep life in order. So we all know that biomembrane is not only just lipid bilayer. Uh, they are embedded proteins, which are also uh, generally modified by, poly by polysaccharides. However, um, even in the absence of the proteins, the lipid bilayer itself is complex and dynamic. It is known that there are more than a thousand lipid species within a cell. Therefore, a lipid bilayer may have distinct composition, and they are highly dynamic. The lipids can freely diffuse laterally, and they can undergo flip and flop, and they can go in and out of the lipid bilayer. Well, this lipid bilayer um, defines the cell, protects the cell. They also set up a barrier to prevent the free exchange of chemicals and uh, information and energy in and out of the cell. But we may not want the free exchange. We, life wants everything under control. So um, the, this lipid bilayer actually provides the perfect opportunity to set one tier of regulation. However, um, for life to undergo metabolism, we have to undergo constant exchange of chemicals and information and energy. Again, chemicals information and energy. So by definition of, uh, by the property, the chemical and physical property of lipids, some chemicals can actually penetrate the biomembrane. Therefore, biomembranes are known to be semi-permeable. Some small molecules such as water, glycerol, gas molecules, or small hydrophobic molecules, they are allowed to go freely across this boundary. So this is known as simple diffusion. But for the large majority of chemicals exemplified here um, by glucose, amino acids, and uh, nucleosides, especially those charged ions, they cannot penetrate this bilayer. Therefore, they necessitate specific transport mechanism. So before I go to my favorite topic, transport proteins, let me remind you there's one way of group translocation known as vesicular transport. Shown here is a simplified cartoon of endocytosis and exocytosis. In addition, there is translocation between different compartments within the cell. Um, it's vesicular transport that allows uh, the exchange of chemicals in large quantity with less selectivity between different compartments. OK, in addition to simple diffusion and the vesicular transport, there are third and major mechanism for membrane transport that is mediated by the transport proteins. By mentioning membrane transport proteins, I actually refer to two major classes as shown here, transporters at the top and channels at the bottom. OK, from these two simplified cartoon, what differences can you tell? Think about it. Now I will walk you through to see the differences and the common features of channels and transporters. So for channels, this animation is my favorite one because it reveals two 
fundamental features of a channel. First, the substrate selectivity. Shown here are two ion channels, the sodium channel and the potassium channel. If it is a highly selective channel, it only allows the penetration of its target substrate. A sodium channel can usually uh, not allow uh, the permeation of potassium ion, vice versa. And the second feature, look at here, is the gating mechanism. So a channel is a pore within the membrane, but life can never be out of control. That's why this pore has to be gated. Only under certain uh, circumstances can it open. And this open of the channel allows the exchange, allows the translocation of a chemical that brings a um, new signal. It responds to certain stimuli and converts the stimuli to another sort of uh, signal. OK, uh, for a channel, the fundamental feature of a channel that discriminates the channel from transporter is once the channel is open, once one gate or multiple gates are open, um, this transport path opens to both sides of the membrane simultaneously. By doing this, it actually lost control of its substrate. Therefore, the substrate can only move down its electrochemical gradient. It cannot do uh, the opposite way. And uh, I have to remind you that the permeation rate of a channel can be fast or slow. Therefore, the permeation rate cannot be used to distinguish a channel or a transporter. OK, um, how to classify a channel? As I told you here, we can do so by either the substrate selectivity. Uh, for example, there are selective transporters versus non-selective. There is non-selective cation ch channels that can actually permeate a different species of ions. And more interestingly, we mentioned a lot of ion channels, but as long as this transport protein uh, can allow the penetration of the substrate along its translocation path, and when it does so, it opens to both sides simultaneously, it's called a channel. So there are not only ion channels, there are also the water channels, glycerol channels, or even protein channels. Oh, here, for water channels, remember, these small chemicals, they can actually penetrate the membrane freely. So the discovery of the presence of water channels, also known as aquiporins, were actually very amazing. Therefore, Nobel Prize was awarded to Peter Agri for his discovery of the first water channel. And for uh, the cation channels, they are more famous or better studied than ion channels. I have shown here are the uh, representative cations like sodium, potassium, cation, magnesium, uh, sorry, calcium, magnesium, etc. And only recently did one channel for fluoride uh, was one channel of fluoride discovered by Chris Miller. So probably there are more channels to be discovered for different types of ions. OK, um, now let's talk about gating mechanism. So pouring, by definition, is a pore within the membrane. It seems there's no gating mechanism, but that may not be true. Even for the water channel aquiporins, gates have been identified for some type of uh, the water channels. So whether um, there's any channel that has absolutely no control, or there are actually gating mechanisms that await to be characterized, this is an interesting question. And for the known gating mechanism, based on different signals, we can divide them into um, the ligand-gated ligand channels. Basically, they respond to the change um, in chemicals, like the ATP-gated channels, calcium-gated channels, etc. And another major type of channels is called the voltage-gated channels. As the name indicates, they respond to the change of membrane potential to open or close the channel. So this channel plays an important role in uh, neural, neural uh, signal transmission and muscle contraction, which I'll come back later. And light-gated channels, have you heard of the optogenetics? And you must be aware that the primary tool for optogenetics is the channel rhodopsin, which is a channel gated by light. And recently, uh, more channels have been identified responding to different types of st stimuli. For example, we can all sense the temperature change, cold, uh, warm, hot. This 
are owing to the presence of temperature sensing channels exemplified by the trip channels. And there are also uh, another type of channels known as mechanosensing channels. They can sense the difference between osmolarity or the change of the uh, membrane uh, surface tension. Or, you know, we can tell the difference between pad or punch. So probably this sensing are all attributed to the mechanosensing channels. Unfortunately, we know very little about them. Only recently uh, were some channels identified, such as the piezo channels. So this is really an open field. Whether there are other means of gating mechanism, think about it. So lives, organisms have evolved to respond to all kinds of signals, stimuli, uh, stress in nature. Probably whatever signal you can sense, there are corresponding biomolecules probably, most likely, channels there to sense this stimuli. And by opening the channel, allowing the penetration of certain chemical, mostly ions, they convert this kind of stimuli to the intracellular signal for the cell to process, or the downstream cells, neurons to further process. So channels are, in a way, the information converter or information transducer. OK, so we can classify cells based on their substrate selectivity or gating mechanism. We can also classify them based on their cellular localization, uh, either plasma membrane channels or intracellular channels. OK, um, now let's talk about transporters. Shown here are two general mechanisms of the transporter mechanism of transporters. So one is the alternating axis, the other is the so-called elevator mechanism. So why do I present them here? Because in history, transporter was originally proposed to translocate the substrate through a so-called solid carrier mechanism. In 1950s, we just proposed this solid carrier mechanism, according to which uh, a transporter may function like a carrier or a little boat, if you think about it. It uploads the substrate from one side of the membrane, and then it swims across the membrane to release the substrate on the other side. That's why it's called a solid carrier. However, if you think about it, if the substrates are hydrophilic, then most probably the surface of this carrier is also hydrophilic. Then how can this uh, hydrophilic carrier goes through this hydrophobic lipid bilayer. There's a, there is an energy barrier. Therefore, this model was gradually abandoned and replaced by another prevailing model called alternating access. However, in recent years, structural study identified this kind of elevator mechanism. You can see there is a scaffold that remains almost static. And then the substrate binding domain undergoes this trans translocation across the membrane. In a way, this Substrate binding domain functions like the solid carrier. But this model is not known as an elevator mechanism. It's reminis reminiscent of the solid carrier mechanism. And then what about alternating access? This predicts that this transporter harbors the substrate binding site within uh, its interior. So, upon bind so it opens to one side of the, the membrane to expose the substrate binding site to upload the substrate, and then it undergoes conformational change to expose the substrate to the other side of the membrane to finish the release. This is a, tr a transport cycle. So because of the alternative exposure of the substrate to e either side of the membrane, it's called alternating access. And if you think about it, even for this elevator mechanism, the bond substrate actually is accessible from either side of the membrane. So elevator mechanism, in a sense, is a specific type of alternating access. Therefore, the alternating, ac alternating access is a well-accepted prevailing mechanism for all the transporters as of today. Shown here, remember, this cartoon is the alternating access. So um, the fundamental feature is it has at least two gates, one on the extracellular side, the other to the intracellular side. And the bound substrate can never be exposed to both sides of the membrane simultaneously. So at any time, at least one gate is closed. 
And by doing so, actually, it creates a coupling mechanism that allows the transporter to catalyze the uphill movement of a specific substrate across the membrane. But by doing so, it has to harness another form of energy to compensate um, this electrochemical ch potential change. So this process is called coupling mechanism. In a way, um, a transporter is a miniature uh, machinery that can complete this energy conversion through this coupling mechanism. So depending on the different types of energy used uh, to pump the subject to pump the active transport, um, transporters can be divided into primary active transporters or secondary active transporters. So if the energy source is light or energy released from chemical reactions such as ATP hydrolysis, it's regarded as the primary active transporters. In this slide, I listed three types of representative primary active transporters. On top is the very famous sodium potassium pump. Basically, they harness the energy released from ATP hydrolysis to catalyze the exchange of potassium and the sodium against their concentration gradient. It is an exchange against uh, both of their concentration gradients. At fixed stoichiometry. So this sodium potassium pumps are extremely important by maintaining the asymmetric distribution of sodium and potassium, hence creating the membrane potential, which is important for the neural signaling or muscle contraction. And at the bottom, ABC transporters, known as the ATP binding per set transporters, Basically, they have this ATP binding domain shown at the bottom. So the ATP binding, ATP hydrolysis, or dissociation of ADP and phosphate all may cause conformational change of this transporter, of the transmembrane region, to complete the alternating access. That's why they are called ABC transporters. And shown here are do they look familiar? Yes, they are the complexes involved in electrons transport chain in mitochondria or E. coli or, or bacteria. But in essence, complexes one, three, and four, they are actually the proton pumps. So they harness the energy released from the electron transfer or the redox reaction to pump the proton from matrix to intramembrane space of mitochondria. And the maintenance of this proton gradient across the inner membrane of mitochondria is extremely important because this is the direct energy to drive the synthesis of ATP. So this transmembrane proton gradient is called proton motile force. So remember, these complexes in nature, they are primary active transporters. All right, so if the energy is not from light, not directly from chemical reaction, some transporters, they can exploit another form of electrochemical potential, such as the one I told you, the proton transmembrane gradient, or the uh, gradient of another ions and other chemicals. These transporters are classified as the secondary active transporters. So basically, they convert one type of electrochemical potential to another type. They exploit this energy to drive, again, the uphill translocation of a specific substrate, like sugars, or nucleosides, or uh, amino acids. There are many different uh, such secondary active transporters. And there is also a third type of transporter known as facilitator. So basically, they catalyze this diffusion of the substrate down its concentration gradient. Um, like glucose, it itself already have, has a, cons a transmembrane gradient, but it cannot penetrate through the membrane. So it requires this type of transporter. It's known as facilitator. But what's the difference between a facilitator and a channel? Remember, the answer is in the gate. So for a channel, once the gates are open, the channel, the transport path opens to both sides of the membrane simultaneously. For a transporter, even if 
is not actually transport. Even if it facilitates diffusion, it has two gates. At any time, the substrate is, ex is isolated from one side of the membrane. So transporter always undergoes alternating access. All right. For uh, the transporters, we can also cl we can uh, classify them through another uh, mechanism that is the transport orientations of the substrates. So for a facilitator, um, by catalyzing the diffusion of one type of substrate, is called unipotter. But for active transporters, especially for the secondary active transporters, by definition, they must transport at least two substrates. So. Depending on the orientations of these two or even more substrates, they can be called either sympotor if the two substrates go along the same direction, or uh, antipotors if the two substrates go oppositely. Uh, so for transporters, there are unipotors, sympotors, and antipotors. OK, to summarize what I have told you so far, there are different mechanisms of membrane transport. There are uh, different transporters to mediate the active transport, primary active transporters and uh, secondary active transporters. And also there are membrane proteins to facilitate diffusion, um, including channels and facilitators. But in addition, remember, we also see the, the simple diffusion of, for certain chemicals and the vesicular transport for a large number of substrates with low selectivity. And in terms of the uh, physiological or uh, pathophysiological significance, I cannot tell you how important the membrane transport proteins are. Just think about it. In almost in each and every process, there is membrane transport protein from photosynthesis, respiration, uh, nutrient uptake, metabolite extrusion or drug resistance. And remember, each chemical itself is a signaling molecule. And the translocation of this chemical from one side to the other, the membrane itself carries a signal, carries information. Therefore, the transport proteins are involved in signaling, as I just told you, uh, especially for channels. And for energy conversion, um, we already learned the secondary and primary active transporters, in a way, they are the uh, machineries that convert energy to different forms. And because of this, Fundamental significance, malfunction or misregulation of the transport proteins are always uh, involved or even the direct cause of many debilitating diseases. Therefore, they are also important drug targets. Now let's take a break to watch a little movie generally in my lab to try to understand this very simple but the fundamental process of glucose uptake. So, when the starch are digested to glucose, they have these glucose molecules, which are highly hydrophilic, have to pass the barrier of the lipid bilayer. And this process is mediated by glucose transporters. Shown here is GLUT1, whose structure was determined by us a couple of years ago. And GLUT1 undergoes typical alternating access to complete the translocation of glucose from outside of the cell to inside of the cell. This is fundamental and is mediated by a transporter. And uh, shown here is another example of the physiological function of channels. So from the lectures of Ronville and others, you have learned the cytoskeleton and the motor proteins, which are important for muscle contraction. But remember, Prior to this process, there is a communication between the motor neuron and the muscle cells. And this communication is mediated by different types of transporters and the channels. Briefly, uh, when the signal arrives at the muscle cells, first, the sodium channels here, um, they are voltage-gated sodium channels that are activated. Voltage-gated sodium channels are responsible for the initiation and propagation of action potential. And when the action potential is related to a specified membrane structure known as T-tubule or transverse tubule, where the voltage-gated calcium channel resides, 
these channels are activated and undergo a conformational change that is further linked to the downstream uh, RYR rounding receptor, which is a calcium channel. So activation of RYR allows rapid release of calcium ions from sarcoplasmic reticulum to the cytoplasm, where the, act the calciums activate these proteins required for muscle contraction. The function and the mechanism and the structure of these channels uh, have represented important targets for structural biology. And um, also, because of their important role and because they reside at the interface between the cell and the environment, Membrane transport proteins represent major drug targets. Shown here is a statistic made about a decade ago. Even at that time, about one quarter of the FDA-approved drugs target um, ligand-gated ion channels, voltage-gated ion channels, and the transporters. And now more and more drugs are being developed targeting these channels and the transporters. Because structural details are important for the development and optimization of the lead compounds, structures of membrane proteins have been uh, pursued by many labs throughout the years. However, due to the technical difficulties, structural biology of membrane proteins, particularly of membrane transport proteins, have been much slower than the other uh, microbiomolecules. For example, shown here is a brief history of structural biology of uh, proteins. The first structures of uh, hemoglobin and, the, and uh, myoglobin were determined in late 1950s by John Kendrew and Max Prutz. And then, three, almost three decades later, the first structure of a membrane protein was determined by uh, Hartmut Mikko, uh, Joanne Dessenhofer, and Bob Horber. So that structure was of the photosynthetic reaction center from a bacteria. That's in 1985. And then the first structure of a transport, pro transport protein, namely the potassium channel, appeared more than a decade later. What about the transporters? Actually, the first structures of transporters appeared in 2002, entering 21st century. Why is that? Because these transport proteins, they are not abundant in nature. You have, most time, you have to overexpress them uh, through recombinant recombinant expression, and they are highly mobile, which made them even more difficult for structural elucidation. And in the past, um, the major approach for structural determination of membrane proteins was X-ray crystallography. As shown here, uh, in order to crystallize your target protein, you have to have a large amount of purified proteins from membrane proteins. They are expressed in lipid bilayer. Then you have to extract them out using detergents, and you have to select the most optimal detergent to protect your protein to make them happy and not too happy so that they can still pack together to form a crystal. Therefore, expression, extraction, and the crystallization, each step represents a major challenge for structural determination of membrane proteins. Fortunately, in recent years, we have witnessed a basically a revolution in structural biology due to the technical advances of electron chromatography. Um, in recent years, uh, more and more structures of membrane proteins have been elucidated using cryo-EM, single particle cryo-EM. Uh, the technical advances are mainly attributed to, first, the development of di direct electron detection, and second, development of algorithm for data collection uh, from imaging um, to uh, classification of the uh, images and also for structural reconstruction. So these technical advances together led to the rapid uh, boom in the cryo-EM structures of membrane proteins. So if you're interested in this technique, please refer to, uh, I, would I would like to recommend a three-minute brief introduction of transmission cryo-electron microscopy prepared by Gab Lander uh, seven years ago. So if you are interested in the structures of membrane proteins in general, you know, their uh, identities, their classifications, the approach of uh, structural determination, you can visit the website of membrane proteins of known structures maintained by Steve White at UC Irvine. And above all, it seems I have told you quite a lot about 
transporters and the channels. However, we have to admit that we know very little about membrane transport proteins. So it's estimated that approximately 10% of human genome encodes for transport-related functions. That means um, they encode for transporters and channels. Yet, for most of them, the substrates and the physiological functions remain unknown. In analogy to GPCR, whose ligands and known are called often GPCR, we can see there are a lot of often transporters and channels there. We need to de-oftenize these transporters and the channels. Therefore, a group of scientists recently published a, preview, a, a, a perspective in cell, a call for systematic research on solid carriers. Not only solid carriers, remember, there are also channels whose functions remain unknown. This is a very uh, exciting field.